You're listening to the Race to Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a vintage-inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out race92.com for all your racing merchandise needs. I'm your co-host, Aaron McTee. Our other co-host, you may have seen walking out of Barber Lounge 459 with a big old smile on his face. You may have seen him at a dirt track. He is Scott Bowie. Hello, Aaron. How's it going? It's going good. It's going good. Um, it, it is getting colder outside, and you are staying warm. I, I am I, staying that's warm. My first observ- I have a couple observations um, of you today, and that's the first one. So you're staying I, warm. I am staying warm because of the good folks, the good guys, heating and air. Um, they do fine work. Um, and uh, if anybody has any issues or if they need general maintenance on their uh, heating and air systems, please call them. Uh, good guys, heating and air. Absolutely. Um, you know, once again, we had our McGilvery show um, a couple of weeks ago. Thanks to everyone who came out. We just released that. I think it was last week. Um, we released that one. Um, Jared Andretti and Gabby Chavez it was a great show. Our next show at McGilvery's is playing on being December 6th. So we're working on that one. Should be a good show. Um, I will also mention on which is coming up this week, November 11th and November 12th at the Grant King Race Shops. Um, I will be part of the event um, with Randy Lanier. It will be a speaking event and also a book signing event. He will be here um, speaking and then also signing his book. So please, if you're interested, check our social media channels. Um, I have the flyer on there and definitely get your tickets before they are all gone. It will definitely be a great event. Obviously, we've had Randy on the podcast and, um, you know, there's a Netflix documentary about him. He's been on Dale Jr.'s podcast. He is very interesting to talk to. Um, and I promise you, you probably won't talk to anybody with a more interesting story. I was going to say in racing, but I think in general. Yeah, it's it's a wild ride. And uh, I think everybody who comes out to the event will be happy they did. Uh, they'll get to hear the firsthand accounts uh, from Randy himself. And uh, he's a very personable guy. I know that anytime you've talked to him and asked him, like he did a little promotional video for the event and things like that. Um, so, you know, Randy, Randy's like so many of us who got uh, – I don't know if the word you want to use is greedy or too ambitious or what would you want to say? And he got himself in a, you know, really bad situation. And, uh, but I think he knows that he got a second chance that he didn't think he was going to get. And I think he's trying to make the best of it. And, uh, I think it's great that you guys are doing that, yeah. at uh, speaker series with him, um, this weekend. So, uh, anybody hasn't bought a ticket wants to go, uh, I know ticket sales are close, so call up Grand King Shops. Make sure you get your tickets and go out and watch the event. Absolutely. Um, I will also give a shout out to Fast Times Indoor Karting. Um, as we mentioned in the past, we are filming more videos. Um, so this video series is Pro vs. Joe's. The first one was Mr. Jagger Jones. Um, who I will also, before I say anything else, he got to test um, his first test Indy Lights car at Sebring on Monday. So he um, will yeah. be eager to, you know, hear about how that went. But, you know, I saw some photos posted on social media. Yeah, I know he's really excited. Um, Monday, of course, everybody will be listening to starting Wednesday. But Monday, he uh, got his first laps. Um a lot of breaking in of the gearbox and the, and the transmission and all that. So I think they'll go out and really start trying to run tomorrow. Uh, Cape Motorsports and, and Jagger teamed up, and I, I know they're very excited to do it. And mm-hmm. uh, best wishes. Um, you know, this is a, it's a big deal. And, Absolutely. Uh, you know, just talking to him a little bit about it, you know, he's really – He's, I know Jagger's very excited and he's taking the, you know, a very methodical approach to it and, uh, like he does most things. So it'll be, um, you know, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see his progress this year. 
Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So b- back to the fast time. So um, we actually just filmed another video with fast times <coughs> this past week, uh, this past week, last week um, with Jimmy Kai, which we'll be releasing, I think later this week. Um, you actually weren't at that one, um, but it, it was a great, I mean, it was, it was a really good video. I think everyone will enjoy it. Great time. Anytime you get to race against a former Indy 500 drivers, definitely, you know, great experience. And I mean, I think the coolest thing about it is just, I mean, just kind of seeing like, I mean, Jimmy was just really just enjoy having the time of his life out there and just, it was kind of bringing back kind of, you know, what drives him and brings, bring him back to his, you know, racing days and, you know, kind of like the approach that, you know, he used to take and, you know, talking about approach and laps differently and stuff. And it, it was just really interesting kind of hearing him talk about it. Um, you get to see some of that in the video you know, t- comparing it a little bit to driving a sprint car and stuff. So it, it was a lot of fun. Um, we have another one playing for a couple of weeks, which will also be a great time. So I'm loving, I'm loving that partnership with fast times. So special thanks to them for, you know, letting us do that. And um, we're definitely going to help promote them as much as we can. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting too, is you had um, a gentleman who has been a giant fan of Jimmy uh, since you know, when Jimmy first started, um, yeah. especially in IndyCar, I don't know if he was a fan before that. I assume he was, but, uh, and he got to race against somebody that he respects so much. So that was really, I thought really cool that you got to be able to do something like that for someone. Uh, Jacob got to do it. Jacob was pretty fast again. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, I think it's a neat series. I, I, I get to see the videos after you put them together and, it's really fun to, to watch him. And I think it's uh, like you said, like Jimmy was very excited to do it. And uh, that's cool. Cause Jimmy's a really cool guy and I'm glad he's having fun. He's ready to go back. I mean, he was sending me text messages the next day saying that he was driving home, like running laps through his head. Like, where can I be faster? Right. So I promise you that next time he goes there, that lap time is going to go down a lot. Right. A decent amount. That's right. But you know, Speaking of that, and you will see from the video, Jagger Jones still has top time. So, track appeared to be a lot different this time. It did. Uh, a lot slicker. It was a lot slicker, a lot harder to get grip. So, uh, it's a little hard to compare apples to apples in these deals. But uh, no, I think it, I think it's awesome that you're you're doing this. So, I think it's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, anyone who wants to have you know a racing experience, please go to Fast Times. Great place. And really, I mean, it gives, it's, I mean, it's, I think it's really the, the best um, feeling of, or being close to being a race car driver, right? That you can get without actually going out and becoming a race car driver, you know, right. paying, paying a lot of money. So just to, you know, to do one eight minute race, um, you definitely, it's a workout. It's a lot more workout than a lot of people realize. Um, and, be just turn after turn and they go 45 mile an hour so it's um it's a big workout you you're you're pretty tired afterwards i can promise you that that's a tight track i mean tight, uh, very tight yep but you can you can go wide open in some spots and and it uh it does man i mean the steering on those things look to be pretty heavy uh so it definitely uh definitely wears you out i think that's uh i think that's a really kind of a good part of it you know, somebody can really get a feel for what it is like to race. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they get the get the arm pump, and they they feel how physical it really is. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but you know, fortunate that you know Jimmy's able to do it. I know some of the you know older guys have back issues and other problems, understandably. Um, and he actually said that he'd probably be feeling it the next day, but he goes, I'm not going <laughs> to turn down this opportunity. So <laughs> he was, um, and I did check with him the next day and he was actually, he, he was actually feeling fine. So fortunately, oh, that's good. <laughs> it's okay. But yeah, no, great time. Um, so like we said today, the, uh, the podcast you'll be releasing is Enrique Bernoldi. Enrique, um, you know, who's somebody that, you know, when I was kind of growing up, um, it was 2008 IndyCar. Um, you know, I really remember him and, you know, kind of following him that whole season and he was just super nice guy. Um, and you know, someone who got to drive in formula one, 
um and he drove in the first um u.s grand prix in indianapolis and then drove in the indy 500 and that's there's like four or five people who've done have done that so um you know it's really cool to talk to him um i mean really anyone who's dr- drives a formula one and indy car i mean it's just he's he's a really great driver um you know he had some really good finishes in in indy car and then um you know, obviously that team started having some problems when they got into all ovals. Um, but just really nice guy. R- really cool conversation for sure. I thought it was a great conversation. You know, um, I didn't know a ton about him. And uh, he really shared, you know, his story and, and uh, you know, it wasn't an easy road for him. Uh, he had to be fast and win everything, every step along the way to get to where he was. So um and that's how he kept getting his chances so no i and like you said great guy uh really good talk and i think people will really enjoy it oh absolutely um so racing news not a whole lot of racing news won't talk too much about it but um nascar um first off we'll talk about um nascar cup so joy logano wins championship yep uh he won championship uh, Ross Chastain was closing in. He just ran out of time. Uh, they had a bad stop, not their last stop to stop before that. Uh, that while they got another stop, I think it still kind of hurt them because if they would have had a better stop than the one before, they probably would have been a little bit farther ahead and it, it right. may have been closer on the restart. Um, but yeah, Joey Logano wins. Roger Penske, the first time he's ever won a uh, championship in both IndyCar and NASCAR Cup at the same time. So congratulations to the captain. Um, Bell had a bad pit stop there um, on the la- very last stop. Really cost him. Um, he ends up running 10th in the race and I guess third in the points. I don't know how they did the points, but I guess third in the points. Chastain, I guess, was – he was third in the race and, and I guess, second in points. Um, and then uh, Chase Elliott, unfortunately, got uh, – Ross got into the back of him on a restart. You know, it looked like a racing deal to me. But, you know, Phoenix, the way they race on those restarts is ridiculous anyway, how you drive on the apron. Uh, so it just, that's going to lead to something like that. So he got damage team did amazing work trying to get it fixed, but they just cannot pick up the speed uh, that it took to win the championship. So that's the only NASCAR race. I've pretty much watched all year. I probably watched one other, um, it wasn't bad. You know, I know some people complained about it, but it was actually, I mean, it's just a race. I, I don't know what people want, you know I mean? They, yeah. they can't. They can't all be running side by side coming to the checker. So um, I thought it, I thought it was a good race. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, kind of on a sadder note, um, obviously, you know, the Xfinity race, um, Ty Gibbs wins the championship. And I mean, just talk about just going from from highs to lows. I mean, just it's just a, it just shows you how quick things in life can change. Right. Yeah, so, you know, everybody knows the last few weeks leading up, you know, uh, he had been kind of a source of um, people's ire, right? People were mad at him for the way he'd been racing them, and I can't blame him. Uh, and then sort of some of the ways he had talked after he got out of the cars didn't help me, uh, but I would never wish what happened to Ty Gibbs on anybody. He wins the championship. He and his family take all these great photos after the race or stand on the racetrack. And, and then just a few hours later, his dad's gone. And uh, uh, just uh, all, all the respect goes out to the Gibbs family and in their time of uh, sadness. Uh, it just, I don't even know where you begin with something like that. And it seemed unexpected. Um, obviously, I don't know too much about. Quay Gibbs and his health or anything like that, but by all accounts, it seemed very uh, unexpected. And, and man, you just feel for him, you know. And, and Joe Gibbs lost both of his sons at age forty-nine, which is just—I mean, 
what are the odds? Yeah. Um, so you just, you got to feel for him, man. Terrible. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's just, um, like I said, it's just crazy how quick things can change. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I don't know any other way that you can put it. I mean, it's just one moment life is, you think it's one way, and then the next moment it's not what you, it was a moment ago. and It don't even resemble what it was a moment ago. No. And, um, so, yeah, just just sad. No, absolutely. Well, I um, I, I do know we have one little announcement, um, fun fun <laughs> announcement. So we actually um, are an award winning podcast now, which is weird to say. Yeah, I agree. Um, thanks to everybody who watches, listens. Um, we are the twenty twenty two Hoosier Auto Racing fans um, media. Media Award in memory of Dick Jordan and Bill Gardner. Thank you. Uh, yeah, a winner. Uh, so thank you to Harf. Thank you to everyone who listens. Um, means a lot. Uh, I know a few of the people have won this award in the past, and um, and I, I had met and known the people that the award is known as named after. Mm-hmm. So uh, means a lot, and uh, thanks to Aaron for everything he does um, to make this show happen. And um, yeah, I just very humbled. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, no, like Scott said, thank you, thank you to Harf, um, thank you to Levi Perkins who runs Harf now. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, it's just um, it's very humbling and um. Uh, and when you look at some of the names of the people who've won that award, it's it's pretty cool to be in, in the list of those people. I don't know if you feel, I don't know. It feels weird, right? But um, it's great. It's definitely great to be. Well, I, I definitely, I definitely uh, respect the award. Um, and I respect that they, they gave it to us. I, I would yeah. never say that we deserve anything um because i don't know if we do or not but i will definitely accept it very humbly and uh thank them for it absolutely well um yeah i mean i think that's i think that's everything unless you have anything else to add nope that's it that's all i got again thanks to everybody out there thanks for all the messages that we receive and uh take care Please like and subscribe. Yep. And, uh, yep, hope everyone has a great week. Our guest today drove for the Arrows Formula One team and drove in the 2008 Indianapolis 500. We're joined by Enrique Bernoldi. Enrique, thank you so much for um, joining us. How are you doing? I'm good, good. Yes, nice to be here with you guys. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, me and Scott both live in, in Speedway. Um, I... I've always been a big IndyCar fan. So um, when I was first kind of introduced to you, it wasn't IndyCar. Um, so I remember, you know, going to a bunch of races and and seeing you. And um, it's it's really great having you on the show. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's nice. Yeah, good, good times. So talk a little bit about how you first got interested in racing. <clears throat> well, I started at uh, age of seven. Uh, I got a, a go-kart as a birthday gift from my father. Mm-hmm. And started going to the weekends to the local racetrack in Brazil, in my hometown, Curitiba. And yeah, and then I started driving. Me and my cousins, we started going every weekend. I started getting a little bit better, started doing local races. And from there, it went, uh, yeah, all the way to, up to here, you know. That uh, never meant to be a career, but as I started to drive well and the more I got better, the more I like it. Let's say it this way. What so was you, it that you wanted? What was it that you wanted uh, besides the go kart? When I was seven, my father had. I was I was in love with horses. My father had some yeah. some racing horses, and I wanted to be a jockey. I would never work because I grew too tall. <laughs> 
junkie to be a jockey now, especially. And uh, yes, yeah, so I went. I started riding horses when I was like three, and I wanted to be a jockey. And the go kart sort of like landed in my lap because my cousins the one in, and it was sort of like a family thing. Well, as a, as an activity for a weekend and. Uh, clearly, I had more talent to be a racing driver than to be a jockey, and <laughs> that's how we end up here. Yes, there's not many things in the world I would say are much safer or much uh, more dangerous than uh, racing, but I would say being a jockey would rank up there as one of a more dangerous occupation. I, I, I agree with you. Yes, the, the car is very fast. Yes, but if I press the gas, it will go fast. If I brake, it breaks. If I turn, it turns. Unless you have a mechanical failure or you have a crash or you do a mistake, you sort of control your destiny. The horse is some, something alive, you know, it's an animal alive. And and the, by my own experience, the better the horse is, more aggressive he is, you know, more alive he is. So it's difficult to control him. <laughs> <laughs> so what point in your in your kart racing did you realize, like, this is something I want to do for a living? And when did... Um... Like I'm guessing, like your first like goal was to probably be in Formula One, right? At some point. Yes. Uh, growing up in Brazil, you know, uh, Formula One was is the most popular in Brazil. Um, I would say when I was in a level that I could win races at national level, which was when I was around nine, ten, I started to think, "Wow, I want to be a race car driver." And but I never really. I was sort of like doing the best out of every race because it is a very expensive sport. Uh, we needed to find sponsors and luckily every time uh, I had a chance to get a sponsor, I did well in the races. And uh, my father and we started to realize that if I was in the pressure, I would, I would perform well. So that's how it's been in my whole career. And once I was winning i became national brazilian national champion in go-kart by age of 11 and then i really thought oh, maybe i have a chance you know right so um i mean talk a little bit about well what was the series that you I mean, because now they have what like formula three formula two like what was the series before formula one back then <laughs> well uh i i won uh two times the national championship in brazil in karting Mm -hmm. and I was getting close to be 16 years old. Um, so that's normally at the time when you start driving racing cars. And I had two cho two choices. I could either do a Formula Chevrolet, which is uh, like an Opel Formula Chevrolet in Brazil, uh, a little bit more advanced than a Formula Ford, a little bit more power, or I could go to Europe. And I had a sponsor that agreed to give me a chance for one year in Europe and or in Brazil. And my father said to me, like, I think you should go to Europe and you should go to the European Formula Renault. We knew no one. We didn't know any European teams or anything like that. We had friends that, I had friends that which were a little bit older than mine. Um, for instance, like um, a guy that died already, he passed in 1995 with a Formula 2000 crash, which is Formula 2 now. Uh, so um, I ended up being in the in Formula Renault in the same team that Tony Cannon used to mm -hmm. race in Italian Formula 3 in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I knew Tony since I was seven years old. So he was in Formula 3. I joined the team in the Formula Renault. And <clears throat> that was like, I had this one shot with this sponsor, and I go to Europe and I win the I win the European Championship in Formula Renault, which would be equivalent to a Formula Four, okay. Formula Four these days. So then, once I won the championship in my first year, Renault they had a works team racing the British Formula Three, and they took me to their team, and I never stopped. So things went work out well. How in uh, how intense is that European formula circuit? It is very intense. It is. Uh, I think, you know, I think if you want to be a Formula One driver, you need to win in Europe. It's very hard to race somewhere else 
even if you're racing in, in let's say you're racing IndyCar, you're racing Formula Nippon, you 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 might have a chance, yes, but I wow. believe you're uh, sorry. No, I was going to say. Well, the I think we saw with Colton Herta, you you definitely it does. You you do have to race in Europe now. Yes, <laughs> with the I with all so. the points and everything. Did they not have the points system like no, that back then? No, or? no my time no. Uh, I was entitled to drive Formula One when I was uh, eighteen because I finished top three in Macau in my first mm-hmm. year, which is in Formula Three. So I could be entitled for the super license, and. By the time with uh, about the points, they didn't exist yet. Um, if you ask me if I think it's right, I don't know. Right. I think some drivers are good enough and they don't have the points. Sure. Because for you to get the points, you need to be also in the right teams before. Uh, unfortunately, in our sport, not always the best one, the fastest one win. You have to also to be at the right time with the right team. So talking about my uh, talking about my career, that's uh, how we how we went. And uh, to race when I went to Europe, it was good. Yes, it was difficult. Yes, also, but the go kart in Brazil was very strong. So because imagine that when I started age of seven, at the time we didn't have like mini cars, micro cars, junior, whatever, all the categories. It was junior category from seven to fourteen. So I me as a seven year old, I was racing with a 125 cc go kart, <laughs> uh, no gears, of course, uh, very very powerful, against a 14 year old. And by the time I was like 10, I was racing against Tony Cannon and Elio Castro Neves, which they were 14. So imagine how hard that was. So and the go kart was like very very competitive. We could we could do like a let's say a whole race blocking someone and would work, breaking everything on the inside. So the banging was very, very intense. And so when like, I arrived to Europe, I had no experience in, in, in race cars, but I had a lot of experience in overtaking and breaking. So I think that helped me to, to win straight away. I think that was, and that's how I could uh, get in a, a position that um, sort of like I shine straight away. Yeah, that's one of those things I think where, I mean, seven's seven's a lot different than 14, but yeah. that's one of those things where I think uh, you either learn if you can do it or you can't, and you yes. learn if you can perform or if you can't. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, well, that's a young age, but that's how it is. Like, trust me, I won the, the regional championship in my town in Curitiba when I was eight, and then I went to Sao Paulo, which was the strong championship. And being a champion in my city, I went to Sao Paulo, I was time like 25th because I was competing right. against a 14 year olds and good 14 year olds, 13 year olds, 12 year olds. And I was like eight side. By the time I was 10, after being beaten by one full year, I could start matching them. And I learned, let's say in the hard way. And right. yeah, and I, I honestly, I didn't like going there. My father was pushing me. I didn't like going there, but once I started winning, that, that's why I said at the beginning, I started like that's, that's, that's like normal human being. And once I was 11, I was winning against those guys. So uh, for me, it was, was like great, you know? Right. So your first kind of experience in Formula One was as a test driver for the Sauber F1 team, correct? Yes. So correct. what? I mean, how how much car time did you actually get back then as a test driver? Because obviously, a test driver, development driver now is completely different than what it was back then. More like a video game driver now, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly what it is. Unfortunately, yes. Uh, you know, uh, I did a very well in Formula Renault, and then I did very well in Formula Three, British Formula Three. Uh, I didn't win the championship because I threw the championship myself. I I won eight races out of 16, and I still managed to lose the championship, which was quite amazing for me. It's, it disappoints me because something that bothers me, because I, I wanted to have a, a title that Senna had, be a British Formula 3 champion, as Brazilian would be very cool, and I, I lost it, and uh, I shouldn't have lost that. Uh, but... 
uh, long story short, then I got hired by Red Bull. Red Bull put me in Formula 3000, which is Formula 2 today. What the time was called Formula 3000. The car is like more or less the same performance, big, uh, uh, almost 600 horsepower. Coming from a Formula 3, which was like 190 horsepower at the time, it was a big, a big jump. And let's say I won the European Renault Formula Renault with nine wins. I won. I won eight races in the British Formula 3, finished second. I won one race of the Masters. I won a race of Macau. So I've been winning a lot. Then I went to Formula 2000 and results was completely not there. It was a very bad year. Uh, I was the first Red Bull driver and my teammates were rotating. We are changing teammates. I was always ahead of them, but we, not, we were not getting results. The car was not performing, was not there. So my first test was like, <clears throat> more or less was like, not like, oh, come and drive from one. It was more or less like, oh, you did bad. We are, we are not performing. You say it's a team. The team says you. We're going to put you in a suburb. And then we're going to have, uh, we have all the reference there. And then we're going to see how is it. And since I sat in the car, that one day, I got the contract the next day. So I think that uh, that's why I said I always perform well under pressure. And I, I like that. I, I like the qualifying day. I like the one single lap. I like those things. So that, uh, that after the test, they signed me and I, with Sauber, <coughs> let's say I did, a, I did like, I would say maybe 8,000 kilometers testing the first year hmm. which is quite good i think give me a, a bit of experience yeah yeah that's a, that's a few laps yeah like about, like we said a little more than what they do now <laughs> yeah but that, that's com that's almost nothing compared when i after uh arrows went bankrupt i became br honda test driver and there was smiles there i think the first year i did eighteen thousand miles 18,000 oh, wow. kilometers testing. And uh, I said, I remember I said, oh, I'm, I'm very tired. Um, sometimes, you know, it was difficult and to do all the promotions, to do all the events and 18,000 kilometers. And I said, maybe I would drive. <coughs> maybe, maybe let's see how, how we can go. They say, yes, we did too much this year. Next year, we're going to try to do a little bit less, and I end up doing 22,000, so even more. <laughs> By less, they meant, they meant more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, yes. Uh, I think one day in Mugello, which is a very, very physical track with the cars at the time, with the V10 engine, it was very physical, and I think I did uh, something like 151 laps, which would oh, be... Wow like 900 kilometers, which is almost like three race distance in one day. It was, um, yeah, it was all day in the car, more or less. Oh, wow. So talk a little bit about, so, I mean, 2001, obviously your your first year in Formula One. Um, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, at that point, I mean, you're the top of the sport. Like you can't, you can't get any bigger than that. Um, oh. I mean, just you know, and it may not have been the season necessarily you were looking for, but I'm guessing, I mean, obviously you're racing against, you know, Michael Schumacher and, you know, just legends of the sport. And I'm sure it's just a surreal moment for you, right? Yes. Well, to the <coughs> year 99, end of 99 and then 2000, I was test drive for Sauber. <coughs> Sorry, I have, I have a cold, not COVID though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we can't get we can't get it through the computer yeah, screen. We can get it the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, um, hey, hey, yes. Since I'm this, we cannot finish very well. But uh, the thing is that uh, we saw when I'm when I'm by number of factors, I couldn't get a drive with Sauber. Then we went to we had some options which would be Prost or or Minardi, and we end up in other arrows which I didn't even think of. So once, if looking back the 2000, 2000 season, Eros was a better car than Sauber. They finished higher up in the championship. So my manager, my agent at the time, which was Hel Dr. Helmut Marko, <coughs> we said, oh, maybe we end up 
even in a better car. Yeah, winter series was good, like the in the winter testing was good, and we went to Australia very optimistic. Of course, we knew the challenge at the time was very hard for smaller teams because we could only score points top six. So it was very, very difficult. And with all the tests allowed as it was, so all those miles that I told you, uh, imagine that teams that had more budget like Ferrari, McLaren, uh, Williams, BMW, they would test more. They would have more stuff. So <coughs> their car automatically would also brake less, would be more reliable. And um, a part of the performance was 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 better so the the car wasn't that so good the engine was really really on a weak side it was called Asia Tech, but that was the Peugeot engine and we at some races we end up like when the BMW really they start to get better we were driving with something like almost 2,000 revs less than them they were already mm. on the 18,000 we were still on the 16,600, 16, so it was a difficult season, yes. So <coughs> by the middle of the season, my Red Bull said to be like, I think that car is difficult to score a point would be very hard. So I think the way that you can show how fast you are is beating your teammate. And... My teammate was Verstappen, not Max, the father, of course. <laughs> right. That was more or less that's what all we could do to try to beat each other in qualifiers. Now, I mean, early 2000s really is iconic era for Formula One. First off, I mean, the sounds of the cars. Um, yes. I, I love those sounds. Some people, <laughs> it's love or hate, right? But, I mean, another thing you hear people talk about is just like, how like you know the drivers like teammates like didn't get along and like how everyone was just kind of like distant and like they would have drivers like of different floors of media centers and i mean was it really like that or like what do you think it really was like... <laughs> I, I i believe that at that time the drivers were not friends at all uh we would say hi some of them we would cross in a corridor and not even say hi. <laughs> it happened. Well, it happened to me many times. And not that I wanted to make friendship. We, we, we had a saying that, well, okay, I go to the racetrack. I bring my friends to the racetrack. I don't go to the racetrack to make friends. Right. And once you... Actually, it's to say that, uh, oh, I think now with the media, social media, with the sponsors being so much involved. I think they have to be more in a good in good terms. Also there are, there's a lot there are a lot more uh, team orders. Uh, but honestly I felt my teammate was my first enemy always in my career. And I experienced that once with Verstappen, with friends in the second year. So yeah it was I was not looking forward to friendship. I was looking forward to be as fast as I could and mainly to be faster than them. Right. Being honest. <laughs> <laughs> I think these days they are more like in a better in better terms. Uh, I don't know if that's true or that's what you have to say, but you know, if your teammate keeps beating you, I think you're gonna run out, gonna end up with jobless very soon. <laughs> right. Right. If you're running second on the team, that's yes. not good. No. And let's say tell you to run second. Yeah, but it's you know. uh you know it's not very yeah, I think I think at that time also um yes, I think the rivalry was a little bit higher, maybe. Sure. The yeah. um yeah, I mean, now with like, obviously, I mean, what do you think about the current state of Formula One? I mean, obviously, it, I mean, in America, it's bigger probably than it's ever been. I mean, Nef the Netflix documentary has done yeah. so much for it. Um, I mean, what do you think really about the, I mean, do you think it's going the right direction? I think, I think Formula One is really growing in the United States. Um, uh -huh. to when I, when I used to race in Formula One, uh, all the years that I also, when I've been a test driver and I used to come to the, uh, to the US Grand Prix. Um, also, when I was in IndyCar, people didn't really care that I was an ex-Formula One driver. They, they, they didn't. 
And now uh, I was in Texas um, last week because I work for FIA. Huh. And I was in a dinner and um, most people in the dinner was were they were Americans. And all the questions were about my time in Formula One. And I also raced in IndyCar. Right. And they were not interested at all. They mm. were Formula One, Formula One, how was it? They, they knew about the V10 engines, they knew about those things and things that when I came here uh, to race, people didn't bother me about Formula One. Right. And yes, and I remember when I finished fifth in St. Petersburg with IndyCar, with Conquest, plus Conquest was a small team and it rained. I, I was also leading the race and then we had got a bad pit stop, I finished fifth. I heard, I'm not going to say names, but I heard like, uh, are you happy? I said, yeah, well, I start 16 something. It rained. That's why I could be ahead. Uh, could almost have a chance to win the race. And they say, yeah, you are. Um, yeah. Um, we don't carry race in front of one. I heard that from my guy, which was close from my team. We don't <laughs> carry race in front of one. We don't carry race with Michael Schumacher. You're only going to be respected when you win a race in the ovals. Uh, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how did the IndyCar deal kind of come out? I mean, that's a big difference from Formula One, obviously, especially back then. I mean, that was so 2008, the, the merger happened. So that was after that. I think wasn't the, the champ. It was champ car 2006. <laughs> Scott or was it 2006? I don't 2007, remember. 2007, I mean. Yeah, I think that was a year after the merger, right? I'm pretty sure. No, no, that was the year of the merger. I was not supposed to race in IndyCar. I was supposed to race in Jump Car. Right, okay. That makes sense. And uh, that's what I... Uh, you know, the things that... Um, first thing is, like, I really like... I, I was being a test driver for year home for the last two years, three years. So I wanted to race again because I was doing a ton of testing. Sometimes testing can be massive... And sometimes you go to a, a test in front of one at that time. And if you have to test the software, you're going to do the whole day. You're going to go out of the pits. You're going to open the lab and you're going to come back in. You don't set a time. Can be good for a young driver. Yes, you will I'm, feel amazing. Oh, I'm driving in front of one car. But I was also a race car. I was a racing, from, racing driver in front of one. So for me, it was sort of like after two years doing that, I wanted to race and I wanted to race in single seater. So I was looking for, for, I got some offers to race in LMP1 and I did, I declined it because I went to racing in jump cars, in the, in the car. I went to race in single seater. <coughs> so we came and I was supposed to race for rocket sports in jump car. Uh, the purge happened. Uh, they were not going forward. Same like a foresight team, which I was talking and so I was like, oh, I will race, yes. Then suddenly I'm out of job again. And then we end up finding a seat with Conquest, with Eric Bachelor. And I think he had more like, uh, he's European. So I think he appreciated a little bit more than I was in Formula One. <laughs> more than the guy that spoke to me and said that <laughs> I wouldn't be respected because I, I was in Formula One, but I was an ex Formula One driver. But uh, yeah, so that was difficult because we got cars from, uh, for instance, my, my first two races in a oval, uh, Homestead and Kansas. I raced without a weight jacker. I didn't even know what a weight jacker was. <laughs> <laughs> so Homestead was your first time on an oval? Yeah. I did this sort of this rookie test for the guys which were in jump car. My team had not a jump car team. We didn't have an IRL car. So Vision... From Tony George at that year, they gave they they had I think a bunch of older cars, and they gave the cars to teams that could not afford at the beginning. So by the time I was racing in IndyCar, my my chassis was an old Vision car. I was racing a 2008 season, and my chassis was 2003. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Without yeah. a way. Yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, um, yeah, so we knew it was difficult, and I, I said, okay, I, I, I want to try in, in a, I would try in a, 
road courses and street courses and we see what can happen. And let's say it was not such a fun thing because ovals was difficult. I felt a little bit uncomfortable, you, especially the big the ovals, which are a lot of donation. I never liked the pack racing. This was a little bit for, from a Formula One. Ex Formula One driver was a little bit like like a Russian roulette, a little bit. I felt that. So yeah, was a, I was always was not a very nice season for me. Let's be honest. I was always looking forward to the tracks, to the circuits and street courses. And at that time, most of the races were in oval, so it was like very stressful. And I mean, the beginning of the season, well, like you were saying, like, I mean, so you had St. Pete and Long Beach, you have very good runs on both of those. Um, and then I guess after that was basically all, and, and then all oval. We, and then, yeah, when then we oval start, or then oval, 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 then the wheels fell off. Yeah, that was, <laughs> it was, right. it was hard. Uh, <clears throat> I think we did uh, fifth at uh, St. Pete, fourth at Long Beach. And I think on the standings, I was P6, I was quite okay. Uh, I like the Indy. I, don't get me wrong. I I like the Indianapolis. I finished the race. I almost got the rookie of the of the year. Uh, I finished one position behind Will Power. So for that, I think I like that race. I like it also um, Milwaukee because Milwaukee is flat. So for me, it was like taking two fast turns. For me, it was like I can I could drive fast corners. Uh, so for me, it was two. Fast turns. And I qualified, I think I qualified top seven with the conquest, which was quite good. Had a bad luck at the start, or your server touched me, got a, got a puncture, always go, goes to goes to, goes to nothing. Then I had a good run also in Edmonton, but uh touched myself with Briscoe, I was top five, and and uh, that season we had you know went well for us. Plus I broke my hand at the end of the season. And then that's it. So well, talk a little bit of so about Indy just a little <clears> bit. So I mean, how much about the Indy 500 did you really know before that month? Like, did you ever watch Indy 500 or? Yeah. No, I watched yes, of course. I knew that was a lot of. Uh, I knew that I would have a, a lot of seat time because we could go stay there for three months, uh, three weeks. So I liked that. I I enjoyed it. the the Indianapolis the whole event. I really enjoy it. I like. I enjoyed the. The fact that you can take as much wing off, we went negative first thing I ever never saw a negative wing in a <laughs> car. For me, it was interesting. It was a, a lot of learning, and I, I like it. And for me, it was a great experience because I raced in one direction in Formula One, and then I was driving the track in another direction. It was super great, and then always the fans, uh, great fans, are very supportive. The mentality here in the United States is different. Yeah. Let's say you you are like a driver like me going to Indy. You I'm not going to qualify in top eight. I'm not going to uh, top nine. That's uh, nine. I think something like that. The first guys. Maybe I will qualify not even top twenty, but they're all there cheering for you. In Europe, it's more like you win, you win. We like you. You <laughs> lose. They're always they're always looking for the next world champion. I, I, I always also I had this mentality, and I like really like that people were cheering. And then on the car day, a lot of people on the day of the race with the I felt like the the straight line was like even smaller because so much people. I I, I like it that 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 race. I I, I enjoyed. It was such a good experience. Uh, even being from a Formula One driver before, I think Indy 500 is something way above the other races in in the in the calendar of IndyCar. I like it. So I mean, when we look at, I mean, so if we look at the past ten years. There's been two former Formula One drivers that have won the won the Indy 500, and it seems like road course racers always do really well in the 500. And I mean, you did as well. I mean, you started what 30th and finished 15th. Um, or something like that, I mean, which is super impressive, especially in your rookie year. Um, I mean, what is it with that track? Like a lot of we've had a lot of drivers say like they approach that track more like a road course than an yes. oval. Yes. Uh, yeah. I finished. I think fifteen for. So yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. So, and I had one pit stop that I couldn't do it. We could have finished behind because my teammate 
park the car on my pit spot and I had to go through. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then I we had I had to pray for the next yellow to come soon before I run out of gas and before I run out of tire. And I could see the <coughs> tire almost showing the cord on the rear. And I'm telling my the car is so nervous and so nervous and and he go I keep going, keep going, the yellow will come and I think maybe one or two laps before they would have to come in, a yellow came. And sort of we were back on the game, but the strategy was all gone, thanks to my teammate. But <laughs> we could have finished higher, maybe, even if I'm higher, maybe I would have crashed with someone because then race gets a little bit more intense. So I don't know, I think Indy was a good result for me, but I think that's what you said. Uh, <coughs> X Formula One rides, right? they do good in road courses, street courses, normal tracks. More difficult to do well in a place like Texas, for example. But Indy, why favors us a little bit? Because it's, it's normal life, outside, inside, out. That's what we do in Europe. We take a corner like a corner. We don't go like hugging the line all the time. So that's sort of like side three wide that you get in like in, uh, and in Ovos that you get like Texas, uh, Kentucky, stuff like that. That's back races. We are not used to that. So it's more difficult for us to play with the with the, the toe, also how to set up the car for that. We were, we were a little bit like, a bit lost also, let's say. So Indy was like out, in, out, wings you put as you want. So sort of more like, feels like more like a, a, a race uh, that we used to be doing. That's that's how that's how I, how I did well in, in Milwaukee because that's how, you know, when once you, let's say when you have to go for a qualifying, the rear wing is fixed by the by the by the regulations. You hug the line, you're flat out. What is really your skill on that, you know? Right. Everybody can hold flat out. The yeah. big thing people I mean, remember in the qualifying, once the, the race started, then it's another big Oh thing. no, I I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. But in qualifying, you, you, I'm sure you have seen people, I'm sure you have seen drivers which sort of type of career out qualifying very good drivers in almost what you just said the line right yeah i'm sure you understand me and the one thing a lot of drivers talk about like the first time in indy just how intimidating the first time like going i mean full throttle into the first turn because it's how narrow like it seems when you're going that fast and also you can't see the other like the end of the turn right like for you how like intimidating was that the your first time going flat out um into turn one honestly in the in the uh yes turn one was always the one that caught my attention a little bit more uh because is you're you're quite fast there and it's the one turn that my car always if i had a little bit of feeling like too much understeer too much oversteer that's what was always in turn one but being honest, Indy, Indy didn't, I was, I felt good at Indy since rookie test. I felt good. I like it to drive. I like it to drive the outside closing. I, I, I felt good. I, I had a, I had a good feeling through the all three weeks. Unfortunately, our, our car was not that much faster, but I had a good feeling there. I didn't have very much, very good feelings in other roles, being honest. Indy, for me, was 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 a nice experience. That's why I always say I I love it. The, I love it. I love the experience. I'm, I love the feedback the car gave to me. I love uh, how do you say is it? narrow. Is narrow maybe for the Americans? For us that we came from Europe, it's very <laughs> wide. <laughs> so why is it narrow at all for me it was very wide. So <laughs> I like it. The the big thing that um, I mean, obviously, you know. You, you participate as a really big Formula One race is Monaco, um, yeah. Monza. I mean, ha and we talk about the fanfare a little bit of the Indy 500. Like, how does like the pageantry of Indy 500 compare to some of the you know bigger Formula One races you've been in? So sorry, I I, I cough. I didn't hear you. Oh no, you're good. So I was saying like you've obviously I didn't been in. Your question. I didn't your question. Like, Look. sorry, yeah. what? No, no, just please repeat the question because I cough and I couldn't understand uh, oh. what's. Yeah, I understand the question. Sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. 
Um, so how, how would you say like the pageantry of some of the bigger Formula One races you've been in compares to like the Indy 500, like just a fanfare? Uh, let's say in the, in the, 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 the fans are, are great. They are huge. They're huge fans. It's like uh, you go you go in the, in the street, for, for example, and they, they recognize you. It's sure. something that uh, even in the night or you go to a restaurant, they, they see how oh, you're going to race this year and so on. They, it's, it's, it's part of the culture of the city. I felt it. Mm-hmm. And I really like that. And um, most of them are very passionate. Yes, yeah, Silverstone, of course. They are like all queuing outside waiting for a Formula 1 driver. But only if you're a Formula 1 driver. In India, I felt that they are passionate about the the event itself. Right. So I think it's um, it's different, of course, than the way it is in Europe. But is um, I think that that was a very good uh, experience for me. The, the fans were really passionate, and uh, it it ma- makes you feel makes you feel like uh, you know if you are like you you're just please to try your best and to do whatever it is, to take part of the race is a big thing. Right. Well, it's recognized, right? Yes, like recognized. people actually recognize yes. nobody's really judging you. Yes. Because you you know, yes. your team is only a 14th place team or whatever. <laughs> yes. Like in Formula One, we're <laughs> over here and like I mean you catch the right breaks. You know, like you said, if you if your pit stop would have went better, maybe who knows, top ten. You know, maybe more, maybe less. Maybe not, maybe uh, a crash. Uh, you know, I, my father yeah. always says to me, I always say like, oh, but he's I and then he always says, if, if, if everyone right. were checked. It happened that way. It was. Right, but that's right. Well, you're right. In, in Indy, it's like, in Indy, the, they were very passionate. And in Formula One, you are a Formula One driver, of course. Everybody loves you. In Silverstone, in Monza, in Monaco, everywhere in Australia, in Canada, passionate. But only if you're a Formula One driver. Do you understand what I mean? Right. That you have to reach certain standard in Europe. Right. That's, yeah. So I was saying, like, so I'm, like, race morning for the 500. Like, what, I mean, does anything ever compare to, like, I mean, just the all the fans that are there? I mean, it's the largest single-day sporting event. A lot of people don't realize that. But, I mean, more people go to that one sporting event one day that any, anywhere in the world. Um, I mean, just talk about just, I mean, those pace laps of, you know, going around and just the whole place just full, um, because, it, you know, qualifying back then, you know, we, I mean, back in the eighties and nineties qualifying was completely full, but obviously past 20, 30 years, people, I mean, it's not full until race day. Yes. You know, what was impressive for me was the parade. That was yeah. really, really great. You know, it's like, a. I didn't, I didn't know we had to do a parade. Okay, once I was going to race and then I qualified, <laughs> yeah, on Saturday you have the parade. And I'm thinking, okay, I go to the race, I go to the racetrack, like this, something, go around. I was thinking something really, really small. Once we go for like, what, four hours, three hours to the city? Yeah. Like people, it, it felt like a carnival in Brazil. It, it was really, <laughs> really something nice. It was nice right. and... And the parade was really good. Also, then, of course, the race day with all the crowd and the formation lap, um, the, the parade laps was uh, actually it's. I was starting the middle middle lane, and both rookies beside me. <laughs> and, oh, now you know because coming from Europe, you have that sort of that experience. Like you have that feeling. Like I go to Oval, I might die. That's the feeling that every guy that comes from Europe think. Oh, I go to oh, I might die, and I'm thinking I'm sorry, the Indy 500 in the middle between two rookies, and I'm thinking like, yeah, so the like like the hard like, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he went well. Yes, it was very very interesting. You know, it's funny you say. You know, he's like the second or third person that's talked about the parade. Yeah. What? I said, so, you're the second or third driver, especially a foreign-born driver who talks about the parade. The parade is nice. It's really, really yeah. nice. That's funny. It's, it's an experience that I will never forget. You know, I took my wife with me, my 
I, I only had one. Uh, my daughter at the time, uh, she was one and a half. We took her because she slept in my wife's uh, um, arms, and it, it was it was really nice. And with the everybody, you know, throw you a good see young people, um, more mature people, everybody there. So it, it was great. It was a is as you say is is an event for the city, and the city is really proud of it. And and makes you feel really, really good also to race in Indy 500. Right. Some of the other ovals you will race is almost empty, uh, but Indy 500 is something very, very special. Right. And, you know, it's funny you talk about, like, Formula One drivers, you know, being scared of ovals, because that's a big thing now. I mean, IndyCar's really turned into a series <laughs> for, you know, drivers after they're done with Formula One to come try. And, you know, I know Daniel Ricciardo just made a comment saying something like, you know, he do IndyCar, but he ain't doing ovals. Uh, and you know, and Grosjean. Um, I mean, he he only did the what the partial season did road courses, and then finally he gave into the yeah. ovals. Well, you sort of learn. You sort of learn. You know, is you you learn into it, and you you sort of start getting more comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, you start um, getting more and more feedback. They kind of sort of like start talking back to you. You know, um, but the beginning it is a little bit scary. You know, because in, Let's say in, in Formula One, we raced close to the walls. At, at my time, was uh, Monaco, and Monaco you got. Uh, it, it is if you if you have a failure and a brake failure in Monaco, you also you are you're dead. But you don't think of that because all the other tracks you have gravel traps, you have everything, and in the oval there the wall is there, always beside you. And <laughs> in honestly, I. I I never felt comfortable going on the on the high on the high la, high uh, lane. I always sort of like try to hug the the line. So sort of like it's 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 a it's a actually is more like a stupid thing to do because if you are in inside you spin you, you hit even harder yeah, sure. than if you are there. But for me being a, more further, so for me I felt I had the feeling I was like more like safe and I like it to to stay on the inside. Once we go to a racetrack that the inside doesn't work, my God, that was a. Uh, if one day I will get a Ustra, I know from from where I got from. <laughs> <laughs> Especially without weight jacket, the first two races was was like a nightmare. But you know, that's crazy. Yeah, I can't believe it. <laughs> I have a weight jacket on that car. Yeah, I, I remember I'm me talking to my engineer like in uh, in Homestead. I'm saying like he said, "Hi, oh, come on, you have to keep flat." I'm saying, "I'm." The car, I, the car is, you guys say lose. I was saying, I have oversteer. And he says like, um, soften your bar. I said, the front is already on full stiff and the rear is already on full soft since five laps. And then he goes like, oops, then we don't have anything other to. <laughs> so, <laughs> next piece up, we put down a little bit of front wing. So, <laughs> it was, yeah. That was a... Um, that was a little bit uh, a bit hard, but you know. Sure. Some guys managed better than me. Some guys managed worse. So I wasn't a bad part. <laughs> so. Yeah. So you're um, so you're talking about Monaco a little bit. So first off, you know, one of the most famous Monaco races for you, and you know where I'm going with this. I mean, what what's it like having David Guth David Kuthart, I mean, right behind you for 30 laps. I mean, that's got to be. It's got to be, a, I mean, make the laps seem a lot longer than they actually are. Um, because, I mean, he was in, you know, a, w one of the top teams back then. And, you know, because I think penalties or something had him start from the back. It's, uh, it was 44 laps, actually. Uh, I, he, until I went to the pits. <coughs> it's, um, that day he was the fastest guy in the track. He did the fastest lap when, as soon as I pitted. He was in pole position. Uh, he had an electronic problem on the car, the sign information lap, so everybody, every car passed him, so he had to start from the back. <coughs> Let's say um, it was it was difficult, yes, but the the whole thing formed in a way that uh, I, I started one position behind my teammate for stopping, and on the start I passed him. And we sort of like touch. And we didn't have a good relationship at the time. As I said, drivers, especially for teammates, we were not very, very good with, with each other. So he came on the radio and he said, oh, and he can read, hit me. And he hit me to pass me. 
So the team, the team gave me an order to let him pass. And I'm saying like, oh, we have 78 laps to go. Why should I let him pass? Let him pass, let him pass. The team owner comes in the radio, let him pass. And I'm thinking, well, I'm racing for myself here. I'm trying to make a name for myself. So I was pissed. I put my hand up in front of the pits. So I want to make sure that every people saw that I let him pass. As soon as he passed, my engineer came on the radio. Coulter was behind. The other three, four guys that were behind, they let Coulter by. <coughs> my engineer said, you didn't want to let yours pass. Now we have Coulter behind you so you can hold him as much as you want. And I didn't think I would hold him. First of all, the guy's way faster than I was. The car which was way faster than mine. He tried to pass me twice, uh, going to the, into the Mirabeau. And he just put the nose and I let the space and he didn't pass me. And I almost crashed because I touched the marbles. I almost crashed twice. So it's like, either you're coming or you're not coming. You're always wanting like this. Maybe he felt, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. And that sort of like pissed me off even more. I said, I almost crashed now because of this guy. So now you know what? Now we're going to stay because now I will move my car <laughs> half a meter to the middle and I, you are not passing anymore. As long as I don't do a mistake, you're not going to pass. And my car was very nervous because I, something that I hated, always hated is understeer, like push, as you guys said. If my car would understeer, I would be bad. I would be slow. I hated that. And I, in, I remember we had a few things and bringing the car to the pits, I felt a little bit understeer. And I said <coughs> to my giant, I think I have too much understeer. So we set up, we dropped a little bit of the front right eye on the, on the grid. The car felt good for two laps. And then the thing was like this all the way, I was so nervous. But one place, that the only place that the car was good, it was in the tunnel. I could take the tunnel flat out every lap, which is the pain overtaking part of the circuit. So uh, people always remember this race. Do I think was my best race in Formula 1? I don't think so. I just think what I take from that is that holding him behind was difficult. No. As long as he didn't do a mistake and I didn't do a mistake. Uh, the track helped me. It's difficult to pass in Monaco. I'm not a superman to say, oh, I hold him in when you're Monaco helped me. What I take it as a, as, a, as a learning and as a as pride from that race is just that I didn't do a mistake under such a high pressure. Uh, then I managed to keep him behind. Right. So, yes. If you think people don't, most people don't know that, but they always say, oh, Monaco, Monaco, Monaco. I think Malaysia, the year after, when uh, Schumacher lost his front wing on the lap one. He's coming back to the field. He passed me and I managed to pass him back the same lap. I think that's way more difficult. That's way... <laughs> yes. How many people passed Schumacher in 2002 driving the Ferrari, which was the best car? Right. So I did it with an arrow. So I think, I think that's way more difficult than holding Coulter in Monaco. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I, I have like my, my helmets from Formula One. In Formula One, at the time that I race, you get one helmet per race uh, by the manufacturer, by, by Bella. And the one that I have at home is the one that I pass to Mark. It's not the one that I hold Cooter. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so after IndyCar, you do, I think, you, so you do some Super League Formula. That's the name of the yeah. series, Open Wheel. And then you do some other sports car stuff and then some Brazil stock car racing, correct? Yes. <coughs> Brazil stock car I did before IndyCar. Oh, uh, okay. Was, uh was the year that uh, I got married. My wife was pregnant. We decided to stay in Brazil. I raced in Brazil stock car was like a... Um, was a was a championship which uh, was growing a lot. Uh, being an ex Formula One driver, the the sponsors were like very happy to have me there. Uh, sure. They were like big salaries, so I decided to stay, and that was a big mistake. I should have 
I should have, uh, not because the championship is bad, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying oh, that's a bad championship, it's not. But just coming out from Formula One, I could have had a way better seat in LMP1 and, or even LMP2 in Europe or maybe even an IndyCar because I was just out of Formula One. So I should have used that better, not going to the Brazilian stock car. But it was a good season for me. I, I finished, uh, I think, 11, three, po three podiums. Uh, was only one race, so you had to, was 42 cars. It was difficult. I uh, was, I think, maybe the best rookie, one of the best rookies. But I, honestly, I didn't enjoy it. Uh, after one race, I regret it. But <laughs> I had a contract. And then I tried to do the best with, with my head, so I started very bad. Like race two was, was starting 29. By the time the end of the season, I was fighting four wins, which was good. But then I came to Ninkar, and that was was a, I had to to get my fitness back because Stockar was not physical at all. Then Ninkar was so heavy, and then uh, yeah. But I think the, the stock, Brazil stock car was a little bit a uh, mistake. Super League was nice. Uh, the car was very powerful, a lot of downforce. Uh, unfortunately, the championship ran out of money. And then I was racing in, the, in Europe in a GT1, which was a very, very nice championship, world championship. Then FIA came up with the points. So uh, me as being an ex Formula 1 driver, I was platinum. Uh, in the for the FIA, and if you are platinum, you have to race with uh, I think it was a uh, bronze, or you race before LMP1. I remember going to meetings with the teams and they say, okay, so we're gonna take you, and then what's your license? Uh, I'm platinum, or oh, we can't take you. <laughs> and I remember one guy said to me, team owner said, I'm sorry, Enrique you will be jobless forever. As long as you're platinum, you'll be jobless because we cannot take you. So, the, to race in GT was good, yes. To race beside a bronze, nice. After two, three races, sort of like pieces you up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... That's a little bit how, how it happens and how and also one of the reasons why I retired quite early, honestly. You know, and I'm going to go back to something you've mentioned a few times. You said that you've always um, performed under pressure. Yeah. And is there, a, is there a process that you use, a mindset, or has it just come natural? I think the way I think I think that I got used to it since I was child you know I was an early age because my parents we could have like a normal life nothing special uh, after two years when I start to be in a national level in go-karting they couldn't afford anymore they could afford my local races <coughs> regional races in the first two years seven years old eight years old fine when I start to race a national level they couldn't so I always need to get a sponsor <laughs> and sponsors for me came like always like let's do a test let's try three races and see how it goes so I always had this pressure since I was a child so I grew up having like make or break since early age and I got used to it and I think that's in a way uh, let's say in my first year in Formula One, I, I never been beaten by my teammate until I got in Formula One. Never. I always beat him. I beat my teammate in Formula One too. You have first stop. And he was in, I think he's nine years in Formula One. My first year, I beat him 11 to six in the qualifiers. Why? Because in the, I that lap in qualify, I always like it. I like that single thing. I performed well. It's not that I won at that, but I think the best of me always came out under pressure. And Mindset, let's say while I used to race at high level, I was not the guy that looked at the data much. I was a little bit more old school. 
I sort of tried to get this in my head. I was never been the guy that, oh, I want to see. Uh, of course, I look the data. But I was not the guy that's spending a lot of time. I was not the guy to do track walks. I sort of tried to, I felt better trying to be with my thoughts away from what I had to do. And I I had this, this characteristic that I could switch on and off very fast. I could be talking. Actually, for me, it would be great if I would have any friend of mine on the racetrack, would be talking, whatever, fun stuff. And then time to go to the car, boom. Now I go. I wasn't that guy that oh, be, the next three hours I'll be only thinking of the race. No, it wasn't me. That's just the way I was I was built. And, and that's how I, I like the, the pressure. I like the I like the big challenge. I like that. I I I like it to to get a challenge and to to test myself. I was very, very hard on myself. And I put pressure a lot on myself. I did that, and sometimes even too much. And uh, but because I that's how I function. That's why I think I was very good racing driver in Formula One. Depends with the car ahead. I was not that good test driver because testing. Mm. I was. I think you know. I think I needed the pressure. I need, and my career has been based on those days. Uh, I, I won the European Formula Renault. I had to do a test with another six drivers to get the seat in, in British Formula Three. I was the fastest. Uh, I, when I went to to drive the Sauber the first time, I had to do a. Uh, they said you did a. We are doing bad in front of a thousand. We want to see in front of one. We have all the reference. So if after this day you are not with competitive time compared to the driver, which was John Lazy at the time, I'm sorry, you're going back to Brazil. Right. And uh, and I made it on these days. My career was built on this on these days that I had to perform, and those days I did. Do you think there's guys, I mean, so it almost sounds like there's a reason why, and it's not so much today because, like you said, it's all sim testing, but like guys who are just career test drivers because they're really good at giving data and feedback and doing exactly what the engineers wanted to do versus guys who are race drivers, (coughs) guys that can get it done on the track Yeah, with other cars. Yeah. I think in my in my generation, uh, it was many guys which were friends of mine, friends. Right. They some of them were like we say like a lion at um, a test a, te- a lion of a test day. The guy is so fast testing, very fast. Beat the 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 the, the regular uh, the the racing drivers. Racing drivers get injured get sick, put him to race, boom, nothing happens. Right. There was many guys like that. Right. Was, um, there was people which were very fast. I, I don't know. I never checked, but I think I think if you go, if you take, I beat Verstappen 11 to 6 on my first year. If you go on every Friday and you see the results on the Fridays before the qualifying, maybe out of 16 races, 17 races, I think Maybe on Friday I finished ahead of him maybe two or three times. But on Saturday right. was there, you know. And that's how um that's how I've been in my career. And I like the qualifying, I like the pressure. I right. maybe that's why I like it indie, because it is a lot of pressure. You know, you have yeah. to the, especially sure. if you are in a team which is not that good. You have to risk so much, taking so much down for of the car. The thing is light. You have to qualify for four laps. It's right. not like long. If you drive in a bad car, it's long. Trust me, to be flat out four laps in Indy, in a bad car, it's long. <laughs> it's like a marathon. <laughs> so maybe that's why I, I did well there. Uh, I don't know. It's just strange. Do you think you've uh, had four scare? La- I was going to say, do you think you've had four scare laps anywhere else in Indy? <laughs> I Indy was pressure. Indy was yeah. pressure. I, I have to qualify the car now. 
I think I could have qualified better, I think. But to, re to retry, you have to waive your time. Right. Yeah. We didn't have a spare car because my teammate crashed the, the week before. Let's say we try with a little bit less wing and I stick in the wall, I'm out. Right. So we sort of like stayed a little bit on the safe side. It was a lot of pressure. I think that's what the highest pressure from all races was in Indy 500. Yes. And risk. I mean, really risk as well. But uh, as I said to you, I had a good feeling with the track. Right. Sure. But I didn't thought I was in danger. I, I thought way more. I was way more in danger in Texas, in Kansas, in Homestead. In Homestead, I think I, I didn't know if I was coming out of the car. Every time I was getting in, the thing was just moving around the way Jacker. I, I didn't think if, how would be next lap if I was still going to be here. India right. had a good thing. India liked it. So India was more pressure, yes. But was for me, was way more. It suited me, my driving style. I like it. Sure. Um, so, in, you know, the last thing I really have, I mean, you're talking about, um, I mean, really the physical fitness and how IndyCar was just a lot more physical demanding. How much has, um, like, how, how much did you, when you were in Formula One, like, how big do you think, like, you know, the physical aspect and working out was compared to what it is now? Like, how do you think that has changed? Okay, I, I don't know how the cars are now. I think the cars must be, I think now has to be must be hard on the neck because the cars they with the big tires with the long wheelbase they turn mm -hmm. in the corners like such speed like they go like almost everywhere flat out more or less <laughs> in terms like like uh, let's say a, a challenging uh, corner would be a hoosh in Spa at my ears. You could do flat, yes. Could you do every lap? No. So you had it's always a little bit of a Attention now. I think that every lap is flat. I think even in the in the, in the wet is flat. So I think that the G force must be very hard on the neck. Sure. Uh, I drove. Uh, uh, arrows had no power steering, so arrows was heavy steering, but the tires were like grooves. So sort of like they, once they start graining, they start to 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 slide a little bit, so it becomes a little bit light. Indy car was really heavy everywhere. Like uh, uh, Watkins Glen was heavy. Uh, street courses was heavy. Um, I remember one was really heavy. Uh, Edmonton was heavy, plus bumpy, so bumpy. It was like you would lose your teeth. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like yeah, it was like really bumpy. And Iowa, I think Iowa was the heaviest thing I ever felt in my life. Iowa was, was so heavy. It was crazy. Plus it's a short oval. You don't have any, you never have a break. Plus right. this little this little, you know, I know how you guys call the, you know, like turn one, and then it's a straight line, then you do two, and then there is this, it's a straight line, the, the finish line is always a little bit in a curve in most of the ovals. And that thing, you, you are always turning, and that thing sort of like start getting here, getting here, getting here, because it's a constant effort. There is no rest. So any car was really heavy. Uh, was a little, was easy on the neck because you could, go like that. When I was in Formula 1, the, the cockpits were very wide and you could not put a, a neck support, so Formula 1 was very heavy on the on the core and on the um, on the neck, but IndyCar was very heavy on the arms. Compared to the normal cars, I don't know. Um, I From what I see from the drivers, now when I go to the races, they have a big neck. I think the neck should be hard. They are very, very thin. Very, very thin So for the weight. I think the, the steering must be must be with the power steering must be lighter. Right. And that's a big thing. We've had a lot of people talk about like who either come from formula one or come from road courses is the muscles in your neck that um, you, you need to do the ovals and Kristen Fittipaldi. We have, we've had him on a couple of times, but he was talking about when he first did his first IndyCar test <laughs> on the oval, he was like, Oh, I just came from formula one. He's like, I have a nice big, strong neck. You know, I don't need the extra padding and all that. And he said he did not that many laps, and he came in and he's like, "I I can't do this." Yeah, because imagine that you're you're never as as I say you're never resting. The ovals are as you go such a high speed. Right. In the, you rest a little bit in a straight line because the straight line is longer, even if you're going faster. But this the track is much bigger, so you rest. But short, medium, like a one uh, one and a half mile oval, 
and it's things like this. <laughs> yeah. Constant. You you don't you don't you don't rest. You know you are never in the straight line. So I believe yeah. You you once you have the support, it's okay. Mm -hmm. But if your car is like sort of like a little bit nervous. Even if you're resting, you're sort of tense. So it's like, it's always hard, you know? <laughs> right. Um, well, Enrique, I, I don't have anything else. Do you have anything else for him, Scott? Man, I don't. Uh, just uh, absolute pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, well, it was my pleasure, yes. Uh, yeah, it was nice, guys. And good good memories from me, especially guys being in India. India is, some, is a place that I liked a lot. As I said, I race there. Both directions is a track that I I love it, and uh, I love it racing Formula One there. And also, I loved when I, my the experience that I had in Indy 500 was was great. Now, have you been have you been to Indy since you drove in the 500? I've been not to an Indy car uh, race. I've been there for uh, I race when I race for. Um, in Lamborghini, I was racing for Wayne Taylor Racing. They are based in Indianapolis. Oh, okay, yeah. Sure. Yes, so we, I've been there a couple of times in the team. Hmm. Actually, since the last time I raced, I haven't been to the Speedway, so it's a long oh, wow. time. Would be nice to get a visit there. Uh, I've never been a guy that watch races. I think when you watch race, the TV is the best place to watch. I never been a guy that goes to, to, so much to the racetracks if I don't have to work or if I don't have a meeting. Uh, but yeah, Indy 500 is for sure special. I would be happy to to go back there and 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 watch a race because that's such an impressive thing. It's it's amazing how many former drivers tell us the same thing. Like you know, if, if they're not working or they they don't really have any desire to go to the race, like they they can watch it on TV. So it, it's it's amazing. A lot of drivers tell us that. Yes. It's actually up since I well um, until I went I, until I was a Formula One driver. I never went to a Formula One race to watch. Hmm. My first time I was if I had nothing to do. If I never went like purely to watch, either I had a meeting or I had to be a reserve driver or something. But never been there to watch. So that has been I think. It's quite common with racing drivers. <laughs> right. Well, I definitely yeah. think you, you you need to come back to experience any 500 sometime. Um, yeah. Because they do like the Legends Day and stuff the day before, um, and you could definitely participate in all that. And a lot of people say, like, when, when you come back after, you kind of, you look at it a little different or, you know, you maybe yes. get a little more appreciation or whatever. Yeah, of course. You, I, I wouldn't have the pressure. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> I would have, if next time I go there to watch, I, I, I'm not gonna think that I'm gonna die next lap. So, <laughs> <not sure>. <laughs> right, <laughs> so that's uh, I'm just me a little bit, um, uh, uh, just joking, but yeah, actually, actually, mainly from one drivers, we think that, um, once you go to Indy, it might happen, so it is very tense. But hey, you you say you you never you never felt like you were in danger in no, Indy. No. In Indy <laughs> I'm just messing with you. In Indy car, in Indy, in Indy uh, Indianapolis, I didn't. I, I felt tense on the start because starting right, in the right. middle. Sure. You know, the middle felt a little bit more tense for me, but uh, the track I liked. It. I had a good feeling. Once the car settled, yeah. I, I was like, um, I believe that was the oval that I pushed the most. That I've been more aggressive and something like that. And uh, because I felt really good. What I my theory is with Indy is it, it lulls you to sleep. Like you, you just make lap after lap after lap, and and then all of a sudden, you, maybe you get a wind gust, maybe somebody's tires are going off, and they push up, or and all of a sudden you find yourself in a position that you hadn't been in, you know, for twenty okay. laps or whatever. Luckily, I didn't have that position. I, I, I want to say, I, I felt the tires going off once I couldn't do the pit stop because of my teammate. Right. I, I felt the tires going up and I could see the tires going up. And right. I was, uh, yeah, so it was that I, I felt how the car feel with a very, very old tires. Uh, luckily, we managed to be in the right spot and, and not getting a, gu a wind gust or 
not having uh, somebody cutting my, my people did cut my hair, but my, somehow the outside, inside, outside helped me to sort of like position myself in a, it's more like proper racing, you know, that's what you learn right. since you're a child, go out, in, out. Right. Sure. When I take my, my, when I was, my kids were starting driving, go karts, I always said to them, driving is out, in, out. So the first thing I taught them, and that's what he <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And I do have one last question. What would be your biggest piece of advice for anybody who's, you know, younger and wants to become a race car driver, maybe wants to race in Formula One or race in IndyCar? Yeah, it's a, you have to start go-karting. That's how you have to start. That's what I learned. Most of my techniques where I learned how to drive and I learned how to fight go-karting is, it's essential. Uh, if you want to be a single-seater driver, even, even a GT driver or prototype, whatever. whatever. I think go-karting teaches you a lot. It's very fast reaction. That's, uh, and you need to take, I think the journey to be a Formula One or an IndyCar driver is so far ahead. You shouldn't think that, oh, of course you have to desire. You need to have that will inside of you, but you have to do the best. You know, I, 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 I think the best advice is to try to be better than what you were yesterday. Yeah, the racetrack will be impossible to always beat your time because otherwise everybody would do a lap record every time they go. It's very difficult, but try to be better. Maybe the lap time is not better, but I understand better the car. I sure. know how to drive a little bit on the dirty part if I can, if I am, if I'm pushed there in the race. Uh, I know how to set up a little bit better the car. I know how to so be better than what you were yesterday. Train your fitness. I didn't train much my fitness until I was in a higher in my career. And that was a little bit of a mistake because that was a different generation. Now I see guys getting fitness trainers by the age of 14, something like that. It's more professional now. And yeah, and trust your instincts, you know? And you have to have fun. If you are a child and you drive, you need to love and you need to have fun driving because something that once becomes serious, it's a job. Of course, it's a very privileged job, but it is a job that you need to focus and you're not there for, uh, for just for the ride. You just so enjoy while you can and try to be better than what you were yesterday. Oh, that's great advice. Well, um, Enrique, thank you so much. Once again, we really appreciate it. And, thank you, guys. Um, you know, thank it's you, great. Enrique. It's just great yeah. talking to you. You know, like we said, I mean, you got opportunity driving Formula One, Indy 500. I mean, that's a very elite club. I mean, Indy 500 alone is an elite club because there's like yes. less than 200 people alive who've raced in it. Um, so yes. it is, yes, it is. It's just think how, like, uh, you, 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 you are guys from Indianapolis. I think every single kid in Indianapolis would like to <clears throat> race Indy 500 one day. Sure. It is a big achievement. It is it is a race that you should take pride of it. And uh, it's a race that uh, <clears throat> I take very proud that I did it. I finished. I didn't crash it. Of course, I wanted to win. The, if I say I'm not going to win, <clears throat> I wouldn't be a race car driver because you need to win, want to win every race. And when, when you don't win a race, this is you off. If you are in Indy, if you are in Formula 1, if you are in GT, whatever. The race competition is the same everywhere. But it is a it is a good achievement, and I like it. Man. Absolutely, I'm privileged to have the chances to to race both ways in Indy. Not many people did it, I guess. Yeah, you, you may be the only I'm trying to. Well, Montoya maybe. GPM. Montoya. Yeah, uh, Villeneuve maybe uh, Villeneuve. Alonso. Yeah, Villeneuve. Alonso. Yeah, yeah, Villeneuve Alonso. Yeah, there's been a few then. Uh, Barrichello. Barrichello, Takuma, yeah, okay. so uh, Montoya, uh, yeah, it's uh, not many. Yeah, not many not at all. It is, it is, it is a, it is a. I remember on the the Monday on the Monday evening um, event where the everybody got their prize. Victory money. banquet, victory banquet. Sorry, the victory banquet after the yes. five. The yes. yes, exactly. I remember I said. Wow, I race both ways and I'm proud of that. 
So that was yep. good. <laughs> right. No, <Yeah>. Absolutely. <laughs> well, um, well, thanks again. We really appreciate right. it. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you guys. Thank you, Enrique. It was, it was a pleasure. Thank you.